Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good to see so many of you up during nap hour. <laughs> and isn't it uh, great to be on a ship where you can go to school and have a drink and even watch it on your own sweet uh, television? Uh, but I promise to give no examinations like my colleague, uh, Dr. Uh, Mackay, there <laughs> early in this morning because um, you have the, uh, the benefit or the confusion of having two destination lecturers. So we are happy to be here with you to be the Department of Redundancy Department, <laughs> along with the other, the other information about the great place of Alaska, uh, so that uh, this is sort of like how many people can describe such a vast place? Well, as many as, they, as visit. And I know many of you have been here before, some have lived and worked up here. For many, it's the first time, but this is a remarkable part of the world. Um, and part of the United States, but again, uh, let's say, ap apart from the rest of the, the lower states, as they p politely call them here. <laughs> and I've been coming for much of about 30 years. I've been working on different ships, mostly research expeditionary vessels, um, some private vessels, and have been through this area and out to the ends of the Aleutian Islands and up through the Bering Sea and on the Northwest Passage. So. I still can't believe it's so big and so far and occasionally so cold. Of course, this area is what they call the banana coast. It's almost warm enough to grow bananas, but maybe in a, f in a few more years. Because this part of the state is sort of separate from all those other places that get farther and more barren. This is a lush, um, temperate, tropical for I mean, sorry, rainforest, the great Tongas national forest, the largest of all the United States and the largest temperate rainforest other than in uh, Chile, for instance. And I'm just going to give you a, a brief look at uh, our ports of call. Uh, you might see some differences between the names and the itinerary because they keep changing. And even I was on the bridge uh, the other day and the Alaskan pilot was looking at the weather and, and he said, oh, you shouldn't go there. Maybe you should go there. Well, it's very difficult to alter the course unless it's really driven by weather because we have all these excursions and dockage uh, appointments and all that. So I presume we will follow the schedule as it is published. Uh, and, and we don't have any really bad weather. We did have uh, swells off of the time we came back from uh, down where we are now, the uh, coast of Vancouver Island. And so we had a bit of a rolling sea when we came back into Seattle. You saw this morning the fog, which meant that we had to slow down to a dead crawl and sound the horn. And uh, I was up there and watch to make sure that they could find their way through the fog. Or was that my brain fog? You know, it's hard to tell the anymore. Like, like others, I've been grounded at home for over a year. And I've, my wife said, when are you going to go back to sea? I'm used to you being away. Why are you hanging around the house so much? And I said, well, I'm almost going to be retired. I have to practice my gardening, I suppose. But I still hold a US, uh, an active uh, U.S. Coast Guard Merchant Marine Officer's license. And um, I've been all around the world and all the seas. But for so many years, I've been coming back to Alaska. <coughs> and I, I, I think, wow, this is a pretty spectacular place somewhat away from all the uh, worries and concerns of the rest of the world. Uh, but uh, I don't know if I could, I can take the cold and the, and the weather and all that, but it's the darkness that gets you in Alaska uh, at, at, in, the, in most of the year. Again, we're going to have a long summer days, and you can see it's sunny so much that people can actually lie on deck and go for a swim in the pool. Uh, so enjoy it while we have that weather because uh, it's a very brief season here. Um, I'm going to show you just some of the ports again. Now, if you want to come up and see, I have a more detailed map of where we are, and you can study this. I'm going to leave this up in the Tours Observation Lounge 11 deck forward so you can look at it as we go through because the, the charts that they have, for instance, if it's on this uh, screen here, are f only for a sketch match. So we are now out of Seattle, around Vancouver, coming up to Wrangell, our first stop. But, but in general, you know that, that Alaska is just the vastest of all of the states. It could be its own country if it only had enough people. But it has you know, a spread out population, only about 700,000 people. 
um, all over the entire state, of which 70% live between Anchorage, the biggest city, Fairbanks in the center of the state, and then Juneau, where we're growing, the capital. Um, but it has all these islands, peninsulas, shores. I'll give another talk, I believe tomorrow, about the oceanography and the seas of the Alaskan world up here, because it's in many places it's a, a vast world in itself. But uh, uh, Dr. McKay sh uh, showed this version of this chart, just how big it is. It's as big as the entire east coast of the United States. It stretches with the Aleutian Islands almost 2,000 miles. And so it has a vastness that it's hard to appreciate till you come up here and just see a little bit of it, maybe even more if you like it. But where we're going is this rugged coast of the coastal mountain ranges that stretch up from Washington State through British Columbia and Alaska, and they continue up into the Yukon and then other ranges in the central parts of Alaska. But where we are, there are very high mountains up to 15,000 feet high, just 100 miles of the, but behind us on the, in, in the uplands of the uh, British Columbia Alaskan border is actually the demarcated along the peaks of these coastal range. And there is hardly any population up there just because it's so steep, so rugged, so icy, so cold that uh, most of the native population traditionally would always live along the inland passage and in the waterways where we're going because the life was pretty easy down below but completely impossible not too far uphill. Out of uh, Wrangell, there I saw there's an expedition to go up the Sakine River. This is a picture of it, how the waters tumble out of all those high mountain snow fields and then come down in these rapid rivers and it goes for some 400 miles. This one river is the, is the only undammed major river in North America at this point. And of course it has a lot of uh, salmon run and a lot of wildlife there associated. Then it comes pouring out near Wrangell where we're going. We, we are going to uh, go up past Haida Island, which is part of British Columbia, into what's called the Dixon Entrance. And then we will go into the channels variously up to Wrangell. Now last cruise we stopped at Ketchikan, which is the usual cruise stop because they have very big dockage. And in the recent years before the pandemic stopped at all, there was a bit of a traffic jam and they had so many what I call the mega mall ships in there <coughs> that the, the town was totally flooded over with, with visitors. Uh, 10,000 a day in a town that only has 2,000 residents. And it's just full of t-shirt shops at this point. Now it's sort of boarded up and empty because they wonder where did everybody go. So I believe that the Silver Sea decided to go to Wrangell where there's only a small dock that can just barely take this ship. And then there's, there's some excursions but there's no great tourist industry there. And so we will spend more of a day to get up into Wrangell. And this is a uh, town that was named after a Russian count back when it was part of Russian America. Th though he never visited, he stayed safe and warm and sunny St. Petersburg, but he was part of the uh, government that, that sent the Russian Navy and then all the fur traders and missionaries out here to the edge of the world. Many of them never returned, of course, but some of them stayed and there's still remnant Russians who are now American citizens um, who are actually their main um, profession is R Russian Orthodox priesthood. They go back, study in Russia, come back to their church in Alaska. And I'll show you that in a minute. But as we go up through the channels, we'll come up into Wrangell Bay. And this is what they call the elephant's nose. You see the trunk going down in the river. I don't know who named it that. How many elephants are there in Alaska? Well, if anybody can answer that question, you win a free trip. But it originally, it was just a uh, small villages of the Clinket native people. And they're still here. Uh, we had a pilot on board last cruise and maybe he'll board again. When I asked him where, where he's from, he said, I'm from here. And I said, oh, how long have you lived in Alaska? My people have been here for 10,000 years. And where'd you come from? I said, oh, I don't know. They have a very strong sense of identity here. I'll talk about this in another talk as will Dr. McKay. But uh, th these people were then suddenly under the, let's say, r the very uh, often cruel reign of the Russians 
who came here to ruthlessly chase all the furs so they pretty much made the sea otter and the sea, furl, uh, sea, sea lion all extinct. But these people have remained, and there are uh, the, the Sheikh's village where I think there's an excursion out to see the clan house and some of the totem poles and some of the evidence of the living culture. And as the native peoples of Alaska will say, we live in the present. We are now modern people, even though we have this ancient tradition that is rooted right here. This is evident in Wrangell because there's a very significant archaeological site called the Petroglyph Beach, which is a short walk out of town. And the, the town only has about three roads, by the way, so you can't get too lost. But there's signs to go for a hike up to the beach, which is all rocky. But there are hundreds of these kind of carvings of which many have mythological uh, 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 meanings we don't quite know, like this spiral of infinity or whatever you, it might mean to somebody. They estimate these are about 8,000 years old. Then there are carvings of animals and people and all kinds of things. So it's one of the major um, sites for the mostly uh, hypothesized uh, version of what the original people came from Siberia, probably on the land bridge or by canoe, to these places, and then they memorialized their visit with these kind of carvings. Well, when the Russians came, and then it was um, leased out, actually, to the British Hudson Bay Company for a while as their Pacific trading post, and then, the, and then when Alaska was purchased by the United States, it became under U.S and then Alaskan state uh, sovereignty. But the town hasn't really changed very much. If anything, it's actually, it had a boom and a bust with the fishing industry. So it was bigger over 100 years ago than it is now because of the great salmon fisheries, which were impelled by the introduction of canning. So they could catch all they want and p pack it up and ship it anywhere, which was a big difference to the fish. Uh, previously, the locals would only catch what they needed, and then the, r the rest was mere abundance. Well, this was a, a very uh, profitable business, mostly run out of Seattle. The fleets would come up. They would take so much that they depleted the stocks, and a lot of the fisheries just closed because there were no more abundance like just previously because they didn't know how to conserve the stock. And the, the uh, um, impetus to statehood in Alaska was to try to control the fishing. In 1959, President Eisenhower agreed that, and then the act of Congress had Alaska join the United States, mainly so there'd be federal and state control over the, so, sort of what was the wild west of the fishing industry. I'll talk about that on a whole nother day. But uh, the fish, the canneries are gone. There's still local sport fishing and some bit of a commercial fishing, but this is the port as we have it now. Now, they built it out increasingly by landfill, so there's, oh, new, new docks, and particularly there's our ship at the one dock that's available. Uh, usually, the only way to get here, though, if you're not flying in on a, on a small uh, airplane, is to go by the uh, marine, um, I mean the Alaskan uh, ferry system marine transport system, which has these very large uh, ferry boats that ply all the way out to the Aleutian Islands and up and around to the Bering Sea. And if you um, are on a budget, uh, it's a particularly charming cruise because you can take your backpack and sleep on deck, which they allow here in the daytime, I understand. Uh, but otherwise, this town is still some fishing, and you can just walk from the ship around to see the the commercial docks, and then there's a few private vessels, and then there's the big downtown. <laughs> but you'll ha you know, y y if you want to buy a T-shirt, you have to trade them one. But anyway, it's a charming town because this is actually the small town of a uh, of. It's not that small for Alaska. It's a big metropolis of 2,500 people, so you don't know everybody in town. But it's sort of like other places. You're either more urban than the next or you're more rural than the next. Well, in Alaska, you get, r you get uh, rural very quickly. just have to walk out of town, and that's about it. Now I'm going to go on just to Sitka, which will take us on, on a passage outside of the Alexander Archipelago and lots of islands and lots of inlets. And then we go out into the Pacific 
and into a bay where Sitka is, has a snug harbor right in, inside of the, let's say, the big ocean just outside, uh, past a great tremendous uh, volcano that lords over the town. And then on the island itself, they have all these snow-capped peaks. So once again, it's this very dramatic seascape of snow-capped peaks right over the ocean. We used to anchor and tender in right to the little town that it is, um, but because of, let's say, convenience, they just this last year built a new uh, dock where we can get off and take uh, our excursions more easily because if the weather's ever rough there, which it sometimes is, especially this time of year, then you can't get off the ship because the tenders are rolling around too much even in this bay. So when you go to town, now w after we dock, we ride a, about a 15-minute bus ride right down into the center of town, which is based around, first of all, the old fishing harbor and then the uh, the Russian Orthodox Cathedral. And you see this, it says Baranov Castle Hill. That's actually the old Russian fortress where they used to have, well, they still have their cannon up there uh, waiting for the next, uh, let's say, geopolitical event. And uh, this was the capital of Russian uh, Empire of the Americas, which uh, stretched all the way down to Fort Ross, California. Now, there's only a handful of Russians chasing fur and uh, other um, benefits, they didn't really participate in the gold rush because that happened after the purchase of Alaska. But this is the one town where you can really feel the, let's say, the history of Alaska uh, within a walk right from the main square where the bus drops you off right near the community center. And then you can walk down the shore to this or take a bus down to the Sitka National Historical Park which is the site of the old Clinket fortress that they built to defend against the Russians. And in 1804, they had a, a battle with, where the Russian Navy came in and bombarded it and subdued the Clinkets. They made peace, and then they have been cooperative ever since. But uh, some locals might say, well, they might have won back then. It would have been different. But meanwhile, the Russians came in and established their provincial government led by Alexander Baranov. The island is named after him, and he was a peacemaker, and he tried to settle relations so there could be the fur business and some commerce and no more battles. This was the, uh, the, the flag of Russian America. And then, of course, S S uh, William Seward, the Secretary of State under Lincoln, proposed when the Russians were having a financial crisis that they offer to buy Alaska from the Tsarist government in St. Petersburg. And at this time, the fur trade had crashed, and so there wasn't the kind of high profit that they were used to. And so the Russians decided to sell it for $7 million, um, which is about two cents an acre for the whole s state. Um, they added, they, they demanded an extra $200,000 because the main business in Sitka at the time was cutting frozen ice from the nearby lake and shipping it to San Francisco. So they said, you, if you're going to take over our lake, we want that much more money. So that's the most expensive lake in the world at the time, and we'll drive right past it. And so this was a hard sell because uh, Seward was a believer in the manifest destiny that uh, we need to take this because otherwise the Russians will sell it to the British, and then the uh, the conflict with uh, British Canada would be more difficult if we don't have Alaska. Well, that's still a debate to this day. And uh, Seward, though, was a very um, dynamic fellow. You may have seen the movie Harriet with about the life of Harriet Tubman. And Seward was also a, a very religious man and an abolitionist. And he took Harriet Tubman, the, the slave runner, into his own house for protection. And so he has a cameo role in that, that recent movie. Well, the uh, curiosity of this uh, purchase got more curious when a Russian nationalist named Zernikovsky noted in the Duma in Moscow that the money for the purchase of Alaska was never received. And therefore, Alaska still belongs to the Russian Federation. And so the cartoon at the time, here's President Clinton, said, you better look, find that receipt. Well, they did find it, and the gold bullion had been loaded on a Russian 
merchant or Navy vessel in Washington, D.C. Harbor and shipped back to uh, St. Petersburg. The receipt was signed. And it turned out what happened was by the time they got back to the Baltic, there was a mutiny on board and the Russian sailors fought amongst themselves. The ship caught on fire and sank to the bottom of the Baltic Sea with the value of seven million some gold bullion. And it's still there. I'm planning to mount an expedition. To <laughs> if anybody would like to join me, it's somewhere. I'm sure somebody else has looked for it. But that's the recent news about the purchase of Alaska. Well, then it became the state and the flag with the Big Dipper and the Pole Star Polaris, the North Star, as a symbol of hope for this great uh, Northland, uh, as uh, Dr. Mackay said, the North to the future. And Sitka, as one of the oldest settlements of Europeans on, uh, in, in Alaska, uh, well before Juneau and all the other towns here and there, is on this uh, foggy coast often with all these little islands. And uh, nowadays it's a major fishing zone because you go right off and you're in the, the bigger waters of the Pacific. And then if you have your own fishing lodge, you can go out there and catch particularly sh uh, king salmon, Chinook, and uh, that's the most valuable of the sports fish here. <coughs> and so if you want to come back and rent this lighthouse and go fishing, it's available, especially since nobody else is up here nowadays. As you're in the town, though, you can walk along this road on the park and the shore and see some of the old houses and the churches. And this is the Russian bishop's residence, which is after many decades been uh, renovated and opened up as part of the National Park Service. Uh, and it is a very uh, spacious home, but it looked like it had no insulation, so they all huddled around the, the fire all the time in their, in their uh, robes. This is the cathedral, St. Michael's Cathedral, which is right at the center of the intersection of the roads in town. Um, and this is a classic Russian Orthodox church where the congregation stands. There's, there are no pews. You do not sit down. You stand up while the priests are behind a, another wall with the icons and not facing the congregation and then praying and then everybody sings along. And you can, when there's a service a couple of times a day, you can go in there. Otherwise, it's closed up. The curious phenomena is that most of the congregation are Clinket natives with the Russian Orthodox priests. And this goes on to this day. So here's a view of the town a uh, hundred or more years ago. And all the fishing in the commerce was right there. Now it is spread out further. There's a very large commercial fishing uh, port to the uh, northwest of the old town, which is where most of the business is now. And this is one of the major fish um, processing landing ports in, in Alaska. It's worth some you know, $80 million a year just in salmon alone. And if you walk around the old town, you can go up. There's arrows and point you just a block or two from the cathedral is the old uh, Russian marine um, stockade so that they could have their garrison there to protect them if uh, the things didn't get uh, peaceful again. And then if you walk down the hill and into the woods, there's the old Russian cemetery, which includes uh, the, the grave of Princess Markova, who had for some misfortune been married off to somebody in Sitka. And you know, you can imagine a princess from St. Petersburg coming all the way halfway around the world and finding out that her silks and jewels were not very popular anymore. She needed boots and furs. And uh, so this is the heritage of Sitka, which is also on the native side um, preserved and uh, represented by this museum, the Sheldon Jackson Museum. Now, the Reverend Jackson was a Presbyterian minister who came out here as a missionary, but he learned the language, uh, the Clinket language, and then he uh, assembled a collection of native arts and crafts from around Alaska, which are in this very small museum. And again, it's a walk from the center of town where there are kayaks and bone work. This is actually Inuit from the Arctic. And then a lot of uh, mask work and other carvings of other parts of Alaska and Clinket um, artifacts. And they have living craftspeople working in the museum. They'll show you things of bone carvings and weavings and, car and wood carvings. So this is part of the heritage and the living culture. 
So the Tlingit nation is or peoples, and they're, they they have many groups and clans all through the interior passage here. So there may be oh, a good 500 miles of territory are are designated as now uh, native lands. They have their own native corporations, and then they have often gone into business in either the mining or the fishing or even tourism business. And this is one of the uh, King she uh, chief sheikhs of a previous. Uh, century who has his ceremonial robe while he's also dressed up it looks like in a in a Wyatt Earp uh, sh a sheriff's costume there but uh, this has been the meeting of cultures which goes on to this day in downtown sick uh, right again around the square you can go to the uh, the clan house where they have um, dances and meetings for the the Clinket people now this is a modern building because they wanted to have heat and electricity those sort of silly things but when you go inside, it looks like the traditional clan house with a big square room with a fireplace in the middle, and all the panels are wood carved with the iconography of the of the uh, mythology and of the clan symbols. Again, I'm going to talk about that another day, as will Dr. McKay. But uh, they will invite you to dance and sing along, which I'm. That's why we're going to have uh, native dance lessons here after we get done with the cha cha cha. Um, but if you go up into the that park where the um, past the museum, where they have this the old fort, then they have the Indian River they call it, which is full of salmon this time of year. And if you get a look on a bridge right over this river, you'll just see all of them coming up and ready to spawn and continue on their way. But the feature of that walk, which is about a mile out of town, is this trailway through the woods where they have erected all of the totem poles that they collected from nearby villages and islands. The population of the Clinket and other natives, of course, declined rapidly when there was um, smallpox and other diseases that came. And so many uh, villages far away had been abandoned. And back under Teddy Roosevelt, there was a national monument made of this particular place and funding to go out and transport the totem poles so they wouldn't be just rotting and falling over in the woods. So this is a very kind of a a mystical walk through the woods with these tremendous poles. Well, I'm going to move on to Skagway, which is up into the Lynn Canal area, which is uh, a great fjord that uh, goes to the north from Juneau. And we go out from Sitka, out around um, Point Seymour into the, they call the icy strait that's full of ice from the Glacier Bay as it, it calves off ice into the into the waterways. Then we go up to Skagway, which is a uh, again another Clinket uh, native land that the original name was Skagwa, or however it's pronounced, called the Windy Place, because you have this great cleave of a valley facing north, and in the winter, the winter winds just scour the whole valley with the tremendous gales. But in the summertime, it's very pleasant, and then they have salmon runs, and you know the life of the lowlands are right there, but as you go up to the end of this waterway, the Lynn Canal, you then come into the town of Skagway, which is built there basically for the, the Klondike uh, gold rush. And <coughs> when a local clinket came back with some gold and showed it to one of the early explorers, then they realized that there was more up over the hill, and that began the whole gold rush. So the town is still there. It's, it's sort of a simple grid with the docks out that have been built. Uh, we are going to be at the what's called the uh, railroad dock, which is on the south side. I mean, and on the bottom of this picture, so you can walk down past the the little stream there, and then right into town. It would take all of five minutes. There is a little shuttle bus which costs two dollars to go up into town. If you don't want to walk that way, you can take it up and walk back, or either way. But here's our ship at the same dock last week. You can see how the tremendous mountains are rising around it. This is completely vertical land. There's almost nothing flat except on the tidal flats where they built the town of Skagway. And uh, that was a rough and ready place back in 1896 to whenever the gold ran out and the rush came, was finished. But this is what it looked like downtown originally. And uh, there was the, uh, let's say, the mad rush of young or foolish people, mostly unemployed men at the time, who came up from a California or even across the continent 
over from Canada to go up and huddle together and then make plans and get provisions and then climb up over the mountain. And this is the infamous uh, uh, Chilkoot Trail, which uh, was a thousand feet up over the pass. And as Dr. McKay was saying, each one by uh, Canadian law, they had to bring enough food so they wouldn't just die on the road before they got down over into Whitehorse on the Yukon River and go down to the gold fields. So they would pack up and they would carry it up and they get assistance or mules and such, but uh, of course many of them didn't make it. And the ones who uh, did may found some gold, but the, the merchants of Skagway and also all the way down to San Francisco providing this were the ones who made business out of this frenzy of people coming up there, the miners. Uh, most famously, Levi Strauss, the, the classic blue jean, is actually miner's coat uh, uh, wear for this kind of work. So uh, that, uh, that's a cur curiosity of the f fashion industry that the roughest clothes, the cheapest clothes become now the most expensive, especially the ones that are all cut up. I don't quite get it, but then again, I'm not a miner. Well, anyway, this is what they had to go through. They had to walk up this thousand foot single file. They would cut into the snow and ice step so it would make it easier. Uh, and you can still do that, but they were all looking for the what they called a Yukon candy. And so the original claims often did come up with enough gold. I mean, there was a ship that came down to Seattle with 17 tons of gold at the beginning of the gold rush. And then it petered out after so many years and now there's just a little bit left for you know a few panners up there but no major mines but meanwhile Skagway became this infamous place where you paid too much for anything and uh, then when you came back from the minefields exhausted if you if you didn't have enough money to pay for anything you just would uh, go back to where you came from and rue the day you ever got there and there are a few of the remaining buildings uh, this is one of the old minor log cabins that is still there. The, this is a National Historic District with the National Park Service with a sort of a, a reception center, films, and then preservation of what is still there in Skagway. There hasn't been much that's happened since except for the ships coming in the, in this major tourism industry that is the life of this little town. Again, there are about 2,000 residents and they get over 2 million visitors a year until last year. This is the old Arctic Brotherhood meeting hall, which is now the Visitor's Information Center, and it's still in its old style. I recommend just going into it, even if you're just walking around not planning any expedition. And then if you're really brave, you can go to the, uh, the, uh, the 1898 show where they recreate the fun in town and some of the shootouts and some of the legendary characters of the town. And uh, so this was, I, I don't know if it's operating because they don't have enough visitors to open up the theater anymore. So the ladies of the day and the night are sitting around uh, online or whatever they do when they don't have a show. But uh, there are a bunch of excursions, one of which is you can go on a hike up the Chilcot Trail. So uh, uh, if your knees can do it, it's well worth the, the pain. Or you can go rafting or there's a whole list of excursions. I don't know how many of them were run. You'll have to ask at the concierge because there are so many offerings, but there's so few people that if there are not enough people to sign up, then you have to do something else. But just walking around the town is pretty interesting on its own. By far the most interesting or fun ride is the great train ride. So out of Skagway, the train, excursion train, the, uh, uh, the White Pass train comes out of town and goes up 40 uh, miles a very steep grade up to Bennett, British Columbia, it crosses the border. Uh, and then it turns around and comes back down. Uh, this has had some repairs, so this season they're only going about halfway, but even then it's still worth it. Um, the train used to run all the way to Whitehorse, and then people would get on boats and go down the Yukon to the gold fields. But this is the way it was when it was founded in 1898. You had a big steam locomotive coming right down the Main Street Broadway. Well, they s subsequently put the tracks on the side of town. Now they have diesel electric engines. And I believe there's a gentleman here who used to work on that. Uh, and he can tell you all about, uh, all about it. But anyway, this is one of the great excursion train rides in the world because it goes up these incredibly steep 
hills over great chasms and uh, rumbles up through a very high grade for any uh, train and then it comes up to the uh, Canadian border and this is uh, right there with the British Columbia, Alaskan British Columbia flag, the Yukon flag, and of course the Canadian flag. Uh, the train doesn't go that far now, but once it's up there, it's sort of on a high mountain plateau, so the drama is really coming out of Skagway to when they have a turnabout and they come back down. It takes about three hours, but that's the great attraction in, in Skagway. From there, we're going to go on to on the, some of the br brochures or itinerary. They call it Tracy Arm, but because of ice and other conditions, we're actually going to the next fjord next to it called Endicott, which is again another 35 mile long slow cruise into the fjord and it's all sort of flat islands on the broad um, Stevens Passage is called outside past more islands and into the mist and then we will proceed very slowly up into the fjord which narrows to less than a mile uh, but this is uh, scenery par excellence there are no towns uh, there's um, a lot of wildlife. Last, uh, last week we saw bears foraging on the on the shores. We came by looking for coffee and croissant. I think that's what they eat in the morning. <laughs> and we saw eagles and seals. And this is, uh, depending on the weather, you can see various things. But above all, you get uh, out of the ice fields, you start to get big chunks of ice. And a lot of it's this incredibly uh, beautiful blue ice from the ancient ice. And then we go up and take turns. You think the whole thing's going to end. Um, but it goes on to more, uh, this is a hanging valley. There used to be ice that hung right off of that. Uh, and in my time, I've seen this glacier re recede about two miles. And so this picture that I took a couple of, few years ago, it's another 500 feet behind that. And the, the, this is one of the glaciers that's receding rapidly, whereas some others in Alaska are coming further out, depending on the pressure from the mountains. And we'll talk about that when we're there. Uh, there is the excursion on the catamaran uh, to go out and go real close to the waterfalls and to the um, face of the ice. This ship is not allowed to get very close because th since the ice has receded, uh, it's not um, safe or allowed to go further in more than the charts allow. So if we go in, we will stay well off the glacier. But if you're on the catamaran, you can go up and collect something for your drink at night. It's very dramatic. It's about 200 feet high ice wall. And occasionally it's calving. Uh, there's a lot of bird life and then also some seals that feed on the fish life that come up the fjord like that. Well, anyway, this is a, a beautiful part of Alaska along with all the rest of them. Uh, and and in, because it's so far in, it's often very calm water. So it can sort of have this glassine seawater, even though it's part an arm of the sea. And then we're going to go back to Juneau, which is between Skagway and, and uh, Endicott Arm, Tracy Arm. And this is, of course, the capital of Alaska. Uh, and it's on the edge of the mainland um, and in surrounded by islands. Uh, but the mountains rise right up from downtown. So that's why there's, in, in, and it's impassable inland. So there's no road to Juneau. There's only roads out of Juneau that, that stop in, uh, not so far away. And there's a community spread around the area. Um, but again, this was uh, the traditional villages of uh, the Clinket people. And so just this year, they, as part of the restoration of, uh, let's say, the native identity for all these places, they've been putting up their names in the uh, Roman letters of the local language. So this town is actually called, called ha ha a, -a uh, But Juno is named after Joe Juno, the French Canadian who went there and found gold on the um, exploration with some of the local Clinket people. And then it became a booming uh, gold rush again. Uh, this was in 1880 before Skagway and the Klondike began. And so that developed into the capital of the state. Now, had, not, had it been different, Anchorage would probably be the, the capital, but this was the first commercial center and also political center, particularly after statehood in 1959. And so, uh, for better and for worse, the, the, the old downtown is uh, full of uh, concrete boxes of offices and uh, 
the University of Alaska and some and also the State Museum. And this is what it looked like last week. You can see the, the town is sort of stretched on the edge of this precipice. Uh, they built it out with more docks. Uh, they have a, a variety of different people. The Franklin Street is the, the old commercial street and the rest has become uh, landfill and then built anew. Um, but you can just st step off the ship and walk down Franklin Street where uh, you, you can buy all the diamonds and furs that they have offered. A lot of it's been closed down though. All these shops have had no business for a year. So you walk down, only one out of three or four shops is even open. But they hear we're coming, so they may open up one or two more. Um, I do recommend if you have the time to go uh, a little further than that, that one shopping street to the Alaska State Museum where they have a lot of very interesting displays of indigenous art and also natural history. Um, most prominently they feature in their atrium a full tree with an eagle's nest and you'll never get that close to an eagle. And uh, so you can sort of appreciate the, uh, uh, the big bird uh, up close. I have some friends who live in outside of Juneau and they have a porch on their hillside house with a same thing, an eagle's nest, you know, 10 feet from where they have their breakfast. And they're friends with the eagles. They don't bother each other, but they, every year the eagles have another brood of two or three little chicks, and then they fly. The, the male and the female parents come and feed them regurgitated fish until they get big enough and they start to flap around, and then they are, the, the chicks are unceremoniously thrown off the, ne the nest, and if they don't fly enough, then they end up on the bottom of the forest, and then maybe the parents will pick them up put them in the nest and give them a second chance. But my friend said, once a juvenile eagle had flown off and had a life, wanted to come back to visit his parents in the home nest, and the parents refused to have the juvenile come back into their home nest. I think I'll tell my children that one day. <laughs> um, well, anyway, in Juneau, though, it's mainly a shopping and a, an office commercial and the political center. There's the state senate and the governor and all that is just a walking distance from the ship. It's a conveniently small town and small government. But if you have the chance, I recommend going into one of the old trading posts. Now this is a, let's say, very different from the art galleries, which can be very um, um, contemporary. There's a lot of contemporary Alaskan art from all the different peoples. But these are the old, uh, what they call Eskimo and Indian. Uh, no, no native wants to be called a, a Eskimo or an Indian. They rather use their own name. But if you go into these places, they're like a phantasmagoria of, of uh, trinkets and carvings. And I mean, this includes walrus heads from the Arctic and you know, big caribou f furs and then all kinds of uh, knick-knack totem poles. And most of them are not made in China, though. That's what they told me. Um, but anyway, that's sort of the culture of uh, Juno. And uh, for you dog lovers, I'll give you another tale about the dock in Juno when it was sort of a barren little dock and there were not that many ships coming up. And there was a, a mutt dog that used to prowl along the waterfront and he would eat scraps and such, but he was blind and he could not see where he was, but he could, his nose knew where he was going. But he would sit down on the shore and he would feel when the steamships were coming in well before they were in sight. And I mean, because he was just sensitive to maybe the low vibrations. And then he'd go around and bark at everybody. And then everybody would wait and say, sure enough, Patsy Ann here is the sort of harbor master. And that went on for 20 some years. They lived to a very old age and would just get up to meet the next ship. Well, unfortunately, the dog's not there. His statue is there on the, the new dockside. But maybe in, uh, memory of them, they have, a, they have the, uh, the famous saloon, the, the Red Dog Saloon, which is again right off the dock. And uh, if you go there, it's a sort of the old timey um, miner, loggers, uh, genteel, um, hard drinking bar. And if you don't tip your server, the, they'll, they'll tell the bear to chase you. And there are bears that come into town because they're just up in the hills and if they're hungry they come down to see if there's any hors d'oeuvres. So when you go on a hike to Mendenhall or these other places, uh, they had signs like this. The other thing that you can do just on your own is to take the new 
funicular that goes right from the dock up to the top of Mount Roberts. And this is uh, an initiative of the Clinkett people. It's owned by the local clans people. And then if it's a nice day, you can see the whole area. And it's a beautiful ride up. And then there's a native crafts and a restaurant up on the very top of the peak, about 2,000 feet up. Another thing that's just new in Juneau is they, they've uh, commissioned some local artists to make these wispy um, sculptures, which are meant to evoke the spirit of the whale and the salmon and whatever you see in it. But there's a whole line of them. That's our ship. And then we also had another uh, monster of the seas docked with us last week. And that's the only sh other cruise ship we saw on the whole trip. And they, I don't know if they're still around. They may, they may have gone to another planet by now. Um, then there's the excursions to the Mendenhall Glacier, which is about two miles out of the center dock area. And this is another National Park Service um, preserve and, and uh, interpretive center. Uh, this is the only glacier, tidewater floating glacier that's so close to any major town. So it's a very easy trip out there. And you can either uh, hike in the, around the edge of the glacier or up into the woods. And they have displays of the glacial ice and things like this to show you the quality of, of, the, um, of the glacier. Um, I'll be giving another talk, as will Dr. Makaya, about these kind of natural phenomena. But a number of years ago, when you'd go on a hike at Mendenhall Glacier, um, there would be a, a what they call a blue fox. It looks sort of blackish, but in certain uh, light and time of year, they, they look a little silvery blue. And this became a tame fox that would follow people and then um, start to play with anybody had a had a dog with them. So they dubbed this this little fox Romeo, and he would almost follow your dog home if you didn't if you weren't careful. Well, he's no longer there. Some local trigger happy so and so went and poached him, and so now they've made a memorial for him. Maybe they'll have more of them coming out of the woods to greet us, but not uh, not today, maybe. If you have the interest, the greatest excursion, uh, if you dare, is to take a helicopter up onto the ice field. So there's a number of services, depends on the weather, um, the pilot has to decide. And, but there's a whole sea of ice right above Juneau, as far as you can see. And so if you go up there, this is like uh, going up into the top of the Himalayas or someplace. And then the land, you can go hike around. But just the ride up and down is one of the great experiences of coming to Alaska. So we are now down in, the, of course, the lowlands, and it's a hot summer day, and the sun is out. And so, so the contrasts in Alaska are quite tremendous this time of year because it's been hot here. Of course, like s other parts of the Pacific Northwest, they've had unprecedented heat. In spite of all the ice and snow up above, uh, you can get a great contrast of uh, environment and experiences here. And I look forward to uh, being with you and uh, sharing this with you. And I'll just leave you one last word that sea travel expands your landlocked mind to new shores and possibilities, and above all, in Alaska. Thank you very much, and I look forward to meeting you, and see you in Alaska. Thank you.